listening to The Big Album Show with Paul Dillon and Dan O'Neill. Hello and welcome to The Big Album Show. I'm Dan. And I'm Paul. We are really, really excited today because we have a fantastic guest on the show. Emma Langford is an Irish singer-songwriter from Limerick City on Limerick. Uh, she released her debut album, Quiet Giant in 2017, for which she received the Best Emerging Artist Award at the inaugural RTE Radio 1 Folk Awards. Emma released her second album, Sewing Acorns, in 2020, and we're going to be talking about that album and the great tracks on it in great detail tonight, I'm sure. Emma also curates the Limerick Lady Festival, an initiative which aims to promote female musicians to tackle the issue of gender imbalance in the music industry. And in October 2021, it was announced that Emma has been included on the long list for the 64th Annual Grammy Awards in two categories, Album of the Year and Song of the Year. So Emma, it's absolutely fantastic to say hello and welcome to the Big Album Show. Thank you so much. Those preambles always scare the shite out of me because they hype me up so much. And then I come on, I'm like, oh, you're the same, Emma. I like to write songs sometimes. You know, it's just like... You know, yeah, I don't know. I've done like songwriting workshops with people and stuff. And they're like, so tell me about your process. What's, how do you do it? And I'm like, oh God, I'm just going to be found out for a fraud. This is a disaster. I think that's your first question, Paul. Isn't it? <laughs> I think I'm the one who's been found out for a fraud. There's my first question <laughs> gone down. Emma, it's, it's so good to have you on the show. It really is. Um, and uh, I think you deserve all that that hype that that Dan gave it uh, and a lot more. It's a terrific record song, Acorns and we look forward to talking to you about it. Um, I was listening to the record again today. I got into it during the the lockdown. One of them, which which one? Which yeah, uh, which one? Jeekers. Was it the good lockdown? Was it the, the <laughs> so, sourdough lockdown? Like, which one? Well, 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 there was the good and the bad. I mean, the sourdough one passed. Uh, I, I never, I could never manage that. But 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 uh, one of the things I was thinking on, I was listening to the record today, um, was I found it very moving as a record and. I found it brought back memories for me. And I was thinking about how I first got into music uh, when I was younger. And I wanted to ask you, what's your earliest memory of being really moved or really taken by music, a song or an album? What's your your memory of that? Uh, I think, um, God, that's actually a really good question. Uh, As a kid, like my main passion was musical theater. So I I wasn't really my only memory of pop music or mainstream music as a kid would have been um, like my parents would have played like Enya and Garth Brooks and stuff around the house and ABBA. I loved ABBA and they're so good, like underrated oh, as like amazing, yeah. whatever about like the danceability and the, the pop quality. Unbelievable writing. So good. Um, I think amazing. my earliest memory of being really moved by music would have been anything to do with musical theatre made me want to get up and sing and dance and dress up in costumes and like be on the stage and I remember I was um god it was so cruel actually I was in a stage school as a kid and I wasn't cast in a lead role or I didn't get any solo or anything but I was put in as a like a one day the girl that was meant to be playing the lead in this song it wasn't in because she was sick and I was subbed in and I got it into my head. I could not understand that I didn't get the role. I was like, no, because I played the part that one day. And I remember being like in the chorus when this girl went up and sang what I thought was my song and just being so pissed off and like devastated. I was like six years old, seven years old, I guess. There was no way I could have understood what a dep was. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess that's my earliest memory of really feeling music in my like core of my being like that just wanting to get up and be involved kind of thing yeah so it's 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 so it's so interesting my own first first memory of music you know my first memory been really moved uh way way back in this but i suppose the mid 90s and uh early early to mid 90s and i remember the the first song that really moved me was here come the hot stepper the remix of that i can't remember quite who had it um but it's funny how how the, the journey can start for us when we're when we're when we're quite young and our tastes can develop. Um, and just on the musical theatre thing, uh, did did you then manifest this career that you now have uh, when you were much younger? Did you um, did you picture this up and conjure it up and say I'm going to go 
from here into what you are now? Not as such, no. I thought I was going to be an, an illustrator for children's books. That was my dream as a kid. Um, I wanted to be an illustrator or some kind of visual artist. Um, I suppose, I mean, yeah, on some level, I was always going to be on the stage in some capacity, but that wasn't like a dream. It was just something I loved doing as a kid. And, and I never thought of it being my job ever. Um, it wasn't until I was like, uh, it was relatively recently that I thought that would be something I want. like I went through college thinking I was going to be a stage manager or a festival organizer or a sound engineer like anything but a touring singer songwriter musician person thing um so yeah it kind of it came out of the blue a little bit and it sort of it it was a very organic natural process of I wrote some songs they went down well I built a community and a career sort of flourished out of that and I was very very lucky that that happened Emma, I'm struck there by what you said about the idea of community and that being something that's important. And I can sort of see that in your, you know, your online work and so on and your pod and your other work outside of music that you place an importance on community. And um, that's pretty much the first guest from a musical background we've had on the show that's mentioned the word community. Never, you know, I'm just interested in exploring that and what that means to you. Really, I'm the first. I mean, I feel like this this past couple of years, community has been so central to us. Like, not just doing what we do, but sticking with what we do. And like, for me, it's given me a kind of a raison d'être for the past couple of years. Is that kind of community of people who have wanted to hear new work, and who have wanted to know what's going on in musicians' lives, and even the mu- community of musicians, people chatting to each other and looking after each other and checking in on each other, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's been a really important part of of my life anyway um and I suppose the past six years that I've been building my career has been down to I mean my first my first gig as such was at an open mic night in Limerick City and I met all of these musicians and they gave me my start and taught me the craft of using the microphone on stage and engaging with an audience and choosing your songs and all this kind of stuff so yeah it's 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 quite a quite a central part of what I do and I I mean most artists it's more important if they haven't mentioned it then it's more important than then they know to what they're doing yeah I mean I, I just I find it interesting that I don't know what 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 what, what, what your take is on, on on what Emma's saying there but I just that really interests me because I saw the only thing that you do Emma on on online is you give people advice and help and support about you know everything from taking pictures to writing songs to a whole host of of different other things. It's, it's it just strikes me as very very generous because the other attitude is to say, well, I'm doing this. I don't want to tell anyone what I'm doing or the tricks of the trade because essentially there'll be competition to me. Yeah, I can I can appreciate that as well. And there is there there's a lot to be said from a from a generous giving point of view. There's a lot to be said for encouraging people to learn the way things work themselves because the reason I am. I suppose as robust as I am as an artist in the community now is because I made all those mistakes and built a thick skin through making those mistakes. But I'm where I am now as well because of the help I did get and I would hate to have lost out. I mean, you know, I lost out in a bit of money here and there from making mistakes I could have been maybe steered away from with the right mentors and that money then could have been directed toward you know different things so it's that kind of stuff you know it's it's such a a precarious career as it is and and funding and income is such a precarious thing for us that I would hate to see someone wasting their money um or wasting their energy on something that wasn't that they weren't doing the most efficient way possible so I don't know I guess yeah on the one hand I always I have this like call sheet that I send to artists that I that that ask me for help on media stuff and it has contact details and everything but there's a big long like premise to it saying this isn't going to work unless you do the work. This is not me doing the work for you. I'm giving you the names and the contact details, but they're not going to answer your email unless you build up a relationship with these people. So do the work. And then this is just a supplementary guide. Um, So yeah, I guess that's kind of my general approach to things. It's interesting you mentioned kind of precarity in the arts for artists and musicians and so on. And uh, like we had a previous guest on the show who talked about the music scene when they started out back in the late 80s. And 
He said that there was kind of um, an allowance made for uh, musicians and artists, even in terms of, say, social welfare. The, 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 there was an understanding there that musicians and artists could be given space in order to, uh, you know, investigate their art form. And even the likes of Tommy Tiernan spoke about it as well. Do you think, you know, that precarity in the, the arts and culture sector, do you think there's anything that can be done to 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 kind of resolve that to a certain extent for artists to encourage more people to 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 live artistic lives um i mean i guess the the new basic income scheme that's coming in for artists is going to make a big difference um i'm sure you guys saw the irish times article that came out there this week where initially the headline was money for nothing and uh, a very a very inflammatory a misleading headline and then an opening paragraph that said how would you like money in your pocket every week no questions asked which is absolutely not how this is going to work um, and not how any funding to the arts works like god's sake i wish we didn't have to go through every feckin ounce of rigmarole to try and get any bit of funding from anyone the, the funding applications are mind numbing for mm. for any kind of support um i guess i mean more of that, more subsidies, more support in that way. In Limerick, we're really lucky in that I'm living in the artist apartments and they're a subsidized scheme by the council to ensure that um, a small group of artists every year or three years can live affordably and rent affordably in Limerick City and stay here and work here. Programs like that are hugely important. Um, but beyond that, I guess just understanding from the wider public that uh, we don't it's not it's not free to produce music so it shouldn't really be free to consume it and um just a kind of i suppose more of an understanding of what how how music should be valued i guess um streaming and all that is brilliant and i i have for years and years used streaming platforms to access music for free but there needs to be a better system and people need to have a better understanding that streaming someone's music on spotify is not the equivalent of buying their music or supporting them in a in a meaningful way it's nice but it's not real support so uh, yeah i guess more understanding and more more funding from the government would be great <laughs> yeah definitely um i suppose onto your music emma would you say like how would you describe your your overall kind of canon of work i know that's very difficult to do because obviously there's loads of different themes and and, and depths to, to your work but would you say there's a kind of a central theme that goes throughout your your your, your songwriting uh, um i don't know i don't think so i'm, mm. I'm thinking of like you know the that that clump of songs that i have out there that exist um, and there, there are consistent themes for sure, a selection of them, um, around, you know, um, <laughs> trying to even think now what they might be. Mythology is a strong one. It seems to crop up quite a bit. Mythology and literature mm. crop up, um, a little Easter eggs throughout my songs in a big way. Um, life on this weird little island of ours permeates my work as well in, in ways. And just i suppose existing as a woman on this planet is is a big thing as well but i as much as possible because as i say i musical theater was my start in music musical theater is what comes out that kind of theatrical storytelling scene setting picture painting kind of vibe to to my songs is what i strive for nearly every time so um and also because my influences are so feckin diverse i find it very hard to just write in one style about one thing so uh, i would say a predominant theme in both my albums i don't know i've avoided love songs for a very long time maybe avoiding love songs is the theme <laughs> and, and what's it about the sea emma what's that uh, what's well, the allure of that uh i wish i could tell you uh the sea has always been a big part of my life in that I'm just drawn to it. I just love it. It's it's a place that I'm almost always happy. It's where I think the clearest by the sea. Um, there's just something very um, leveling about it. Um, in the same way that a lot of people look up at the sky at night and think about the vastness of the universe and how small they are. The sea does that for me. Um, 
And I suppose when I start to write, when I think of the sea, it, it does that for me. It gives me that sense of perspective. My mother has always, you know, on, when in times when I'm really fraught and really tense, she'll like her instinct is like, let's go to the sea. Mom will go to the sea since I was a kid, always. And uh, yeah, I guess I've just been a water baby all my life. So not now. I will, I will clarify that in that I'm simultaneously a water baby, but I hate being cold. So I'm not one of these. <laughs> my younger sister, my little sister is like a, a, a wild swimmer. She'll go out into the rivers, into the lakes in early morning, like five days a week. And I'm like, no, thank you. I am fine with a bath. It's grand. Um, but I, I do love being in the water so long as I can stay warm afterwards. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because when I was walking around today, uh, I was saying, how do we you know the way normally you can put, but not often, I should say, you can put someone in a box and say, mm. they're this, they're this, they're this scene, they're that scene. And I was thinking to myself, I'm not going to be able to draw on any references for, for this conversation with Emma whatsoever, <laughs> because I cannot put this in a box. But what I could get very strongly was the imagery of the sea and also maybe being a child. That was what was coming out for me. And, you know, I, it was really painting a picture. One of the, the questions I, I was going to ask you, but I think um, I think it's kind of passed out, but it is, is, is how you write your songs. Um, but I'm kind of guessing maybe there isn't one way that you do that. Yeah, I'm, I always feel really bad whenever anyone asks that question because I <laughs> give the vaguest, most nonsense answer. I... I think of songwriting as <laughs> my fiance is listening in the next room. He's going to snort. Uh, I think of songwriting like foraging. So it's like I will just immerse myself in a load of stuff like books and paint. Like I'll go and look at paintings and pictures and I'll listen to someone else's music and I'll watch something I haven't watched before. And I'll talk to someone I haven't talked to in a while about something that I am curious about. And I'll see what emerges. It's usually when I when I have a song I know I want to write is when I'll do that. There's something brewing and I just can't put a shape on it. Um, so I'll just immerse myself in a world of art and allow it to kind of shape my thoughts a bit. Um, but yeah, it is. It's different from time to time. There is there is an organic process in that like I remember one of my songs on Quiet Giant, my first album, called, the song is called All You Want. And I remember standing at a traffic light waiting to cross. And uh, do you know the like the beep that happens? On the, the beep, 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 beep. I was like. Do, 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 do. And like just coming up with things based on sounds in my environment are, is, is a big way that, that melody happens, that the, the movement of a song happens. And I'll just use that. I, I'll allow that flow state to set in with the melody and the swing of it and see where my head goes in terms of words and thoughts and ideas and kind of allow, allow the lyrics to evolve from there as well. So it's, as I say, the most vague nonsense answer in the whole wide world. Basically just songs fall from the sky into my brain and then I write them. <laughs> so. And, and how did you... Um, Again, you know, it's it's a, it's just a general question about Stone Acorns as, as a record. How did you record it, and and what was the process like? I mean, was that fraught? Was it difficult? Uh, was it tense? Was it joyful? Was it all many things? What was it like making the in the, the record? Um, it was really fun. It was really really fun. I had learned a lot in the making of my first album, so. Quiet Giant happened by accident. It was um, the result of I got booked for a tour of Germany, my first ever international tour, and was essentially a very, very long story and convoluted story short. I was given six months to produce an album. And that is for anyone who's produced an album, that is unless you have big money behind you, that is a challenge. Um, but through making that record, I learned a lot. So I worked with these two amazing producers. I worked with this incredible band. I had all these songs written that I was ready to put out into the world um, that were I had gigged them a lot with this band. So we were really comfortable. So we basically went into studio and recorded it all together, more or less live in studio. Whereas then with Sewing Acorns, I went and I worked with the same guys, the same band, the same producers in the same studios. But it was what was it 2017 so it was two years worth of building up this bank of songs having toured and having released an album already this pile of songs that I was bursting to release it wasn't like I had to release an album I was just like I'm dying to say something and 
So with sowing acorns, it was just this flurry of excitement and energy. So between 2019 and 2020, we recorded it. Uh, the band, so I went into the studio and sat down with the producers, recorded guide tracks for all of the tracks. We worked out together what the tempo needed to be. Tiny little differences in BPM from, like, you know, from each each song had its own little things that they went, they put down an, a, BP, a BPM for me. So a, um, a click track that I would play along with and they'd be like, is that comfortable for you? You sound like it's not comfortable for you. Come out here and play it on the couch for us here as you play it usually. What would you play it like on stage? Mm. So I go back out into the room play it for them and they're like right 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 so we're like okay cool so we're like yeah so one beat quicker here and what we're going to do is going to create a you know a a section here where it's going to be like a beat slower so you can kind of sit into that a bit and so I had these guys that just really understood how I work and how I needed to work and 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 what I needed to make the songs sort of shine as best they could um and from there, then we use those demos, those really fine tuned demos as a guide for the band. The band went to Port Leash and recorded their parts there separately. And I was in the room, in the booth, watching what they were doing, giving a bit of feedback, coming up with parts, all this kind of stuff. And everyone got stuck. And then after all that was done, I came back to studio in Dublin and I recorded my re-recorded my guitars and my vocals on top of that. And so it was a bit of a circular process, but it meant that nobody played um without having my voice in mind nobody kind of played a part without knowing what my levels were like and my energy was like in those parts of the songs and everyone was very sensitive to that so yeah it was um it was a really really fun process and then you know working with the guys as well like songs like sewing acorns where there was like a spoken word part got dropped in that was that was a really cool process because it was like a last minute thing where I was like, oh, I just heard this thing and I know we've already got the track more or less ready. Can can we put this in here? And just having a bit of fun and a bit of play and a bit of wiggle room at that was great. So that was, I think that was kind of most of the process. You're listening to The Big Album Show with Paul and Dan. Please remember to subscribe, hit like, and remember to follow us on our social media platforms at The Big Album Show. So what we generally do on the show then is we ask people, we go around and we get people to pick their top three songs from the album. Um, so I don't know if you want to go first, Emma, or do you want us to tell you what our top three songs are? And you can, you can I don't know, just respond and then tell us your three or what way do you want to do it? No, I think I'd, I, I'd love to hear your, your top threes first because... I feel like I'll pick three and then you guys will say you're three and then I'll change my mind. So. <laughs> right, yeah. Paul, Paul, hit me with your top three. What's your top I, three I, tracks I, off the album? I, I, I tell you what my I, I difficulty in, in, in this, I, I always do, but unquestionably my favorite track uh, is Mariana. And it, it's, I, I, I love the during lockdown. I thought the video for it was so good. And mm. I, 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 it was like it was written for that period in that weird way that music can sometimes do that, you know, and the, just the, the reassurance in it, the strength in it, uh, the melody in it, um, and that terrific video of being in um, a kitchen. Now, maybe the, the, uh, it, 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 and then going out, and that was very much my experience at the time, being in the kitchen and then going outside. So that for me is just my absolute, uh, it is my top track on the album. It's always difficult for me to get to three, but I can definitely get one on this. And it's, it's definitely that for me. Oh, that's lovely. That's so nice to hear. Because like when we made that music video, it was, you know, it was a lockdown project. And Sophia made that video more or less on her own. It was herself and she's living with Paddy Casey. So he was like holding the camera for her. Um, and then Searsha, Paddy's daughter, was like in the background, like moving props around and stuff. But it was just Sophia and and yeah, I remember watching it and it was shortly after a friend of mine had died and there was a real cathartic sense of um, liberation to the to the video. Um, and it's such a, like for me, the, the track and the music video are so closely connected always. I always have a sense of what the visual should be and is. So it's really lovely that you have that kind of connection between the two as well. Okay, Paul, and what would be your, your second? Probably, probably the title track, Soul and Acorns. Um, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, it just get, it, it just got me when I first heard it, and 
um, I find it quite uplifting, you know, <laughs> I find it quite joyful. And I, I like that in music. It's almost an unashamed joy to it. Now, that's how, that's how I, I listen to it. I mean, I, I don't know how, how what, what others, how others feel or how you feel about it yourself. But for me, it's just joyful. And, and I love that about it, you know. That's, I, that's in my top three as well. And um, so, you know, I, I, lo- I love, I love, I love, the way it starts i love the the poetry in it and um, i love i love the fact that about one minute 30 seconds in or so you get this kind of uh florence sound you know it's it's really big it's really strong and then it goes quiet again there's great contrast in the song um fantastic thanks so much cheers yeah it was uh that was a really fun project for me it was like weaving a a tapestry or something like there was so much to it and that contra- contrast between the chorus and the verse was really important to me because when I was writing it, I had a Florence kind of feeling to it when I was writing it, a mixture of like that and the staves and this just this epic kind of image of like the, the mental image I have, even though there's a full band on it, is just one woman and a drum. Like it's just yeah. this like massive kind of sound. And I suppose, yeah, when I was writing Sewing Acorns itself, I the, the verses kind of deal with anxiety and insomnia and fever dreams and sleeplessness and all that kind of stuff. But then the chorus is, as, as you say, Paul, like joyful, like it's reckless abandon. It's letting all of that go and shaking off all of that stress and worry and just diving into it kind of thing. Um, so I'm really glad you guys connected with it in that way. It's lovely. My my other two tracks, and I, I'm I'm cheating and doing two and four. Uh, but it's this is the advantage. It's, it's our pod, so we, mm, yeah, we do what we want. <laughs> uh, it's I I I really like the the, the winding way down to Kells Bay because it, it was a song that kind of introduced me to you, Emma, in terms. And I think it was John Creedon, you know, um, who and I picked up on that. So I kind of feel as if I have to. It has to be there because it was my 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 my, my way in. But I love Sailor's Wife, and um, I I just think it's terrific. I think it's funny as well, which is great. And maybe it's not meant to be funny. It's funny for me, I, and I just love the the image that it paints uh, of the say the Sailor's Wife, and you know that sea shanty thing that came, became very fashionable. Mm. Um, I, I I have difficulty keeping up what's in fashion now. Maybe it's no longer in fashion, <laughs> but it was fashionable for a period. But it's it's just a terrific track, and that idea you know of of a story it's just t- told so well and it's so evocative that you get the picture you know uh and you know the guy's gonna have to see and 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 and, and she's waiting there and you know it's that romanticism for me as well about the sea and people going away and coming back and that's one that's the oldest story really isn't it or mm. one of the oldest stories and you can see it in kids things as well you know and um, so for me I, I mean i'm gonna put i'm gonna I, i'm gonna put the two of them they're equal fair because I, I, I love both of them um but you know, just two two really standout tracks. I could put, have gone a few more, but I'm I'm going to try to so good. It doesn't count as favourites. So we just go. start listing all the tracks. <laughs> um, I'm glad you found the the humour in Sailor's Wife because not everyone does, and uh, there is humour in it. There is, I mean, the the main character is is meant to be as kind of a, a dry, kind of acerbic, bitter woman who's like sort of given out to her husband really for fecking off and doing whatever he wanted and she's left at home to hold the baby kind of thing and she's half thinking sure look I'll just go out myself and be a fecking sailor will I will I I'll just go on go on sure you're probably fecking dead anyway so I'll just go out (laughs) so yeah you're 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 (laughs) you're spot on with that it's perfect thank you uh, one of the things I love about your music, Emma, is that with, with, a, with a lot of your songs, I feel like they're genuine, heartfelt, timeless additions to the great Irish songbook, if there's such a thing. You know, I think that the, the, your songs, I, I believe anyway, are, 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 are going to be sung in 100 years time, in 150 years time, at parties and at wakes and at, 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 at anywhere where, where people gather because they really do have a timeless kind of feel to them. And definitely with songs like, you know, Winding, Winding Way to Kells Bay, like already when you type it into the name of the song into Spotify, you see other people doing covers of the song because it, it just, it's so, it's so incredible and so singable and so evocative that it just lends itself to wanting to be sung if that makes sense and uh 
then an, another one of my my favorite songs on the album is bird song um so like good. When, when we were tweeting about you um, before this uh, recording, one of the words we use to describe you, Emma, and I hope you don't mind, is powerful. And I think that is a powerful, powerful song. And it, 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 it kind of reminds me of the kind of, there's an American folkiness to it, um, almost like a, a Southern gospel vibe to it, maybe. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but that's kind of what I hear from it. Um, and you nearly want to punch the air when you're listening to it sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really powerful song. That's Thank you. Yeah, I when I was writing it, I was channeling a bit of Annie Lennox, actually, when I first wrote that song, even though it's, you know, interpreted a lot as very Irish folk. And it is, it's, you know, it's inspired by Irish traditional music and uh, the feel of it is actually a Scottish walking song. Okay. So, um it's inspired by the tradition in Scotland of sitting women would sit around a table um, and soften cloth for for clothes. So they would have a rhythm similar to a sea shanty, actually, where they would have a rhythm to to the song. One woman would start and then all the women would, would join in and then someone else would take over and everyone would join in. And it's, it was a way of keeping up, keeping up energy and keeping up uh, morale at the table um, for hours and hours of work. Um, so it had all that to it. But when I sat down to write it, you know, I didn't have the, at the core of myself, I didn't have that education, that knowledge of those traditions. What I had was what I knew and the music I knew. And I was listening to like Rhiannon Giddens and Annie Lennox and, you know, all of these, as you say, kind of kind of almost gospel feel songs in parts where there's these big anthemic um, come all ye sort of sections. And that's what I wanted to incorporate. I actually had like a killer sort of guitar lick that was meant to go in there. I recorded it the same day I recorded another song, Tug of War, and both of them were recorded with a loop pedal in a dark room with a lamp shining on my face. And uh, yeah, so there's all these like big like drum parts and like guitar licks and stuff that were meant to be in those songs. And then, you know, Chris and Gray and my producers stripped them back to what they're meant to be, which is me, my voice, my story. Um, but I was like, nah, it needs to have like this mad production and all this mad stuff. And they're like, no, 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 bird song should just be a cappella. And I was like, you're crazy uh but it worked out you know it, it resonated with people a lot more I think and it, it it allowed it to sort of stand out a little bit for what it is which uh you know the guys are fecking geniuses so yeah and and then another another one that stood out to me because it's so different from the other ones and I was actually out walking when it really grasped me I was out walking through the countryside and listening to the album in my headphones and uh, Portna Pookie, if I pronounce that right, because I'm not very good at the Gaelga, uh, <laughs> came on. And it just struck me. I don't know what, why, but when I was looking at the, the, the scenery around me and that uh, the, the sound of the cellos, there was something so... I, 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 I can't actually... It, sometimes music, for me... When you're listening to it, 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 it evokes feelings that are you can't really describe in words. Um, but it brought my mind to a very peaceful place and, and connected me with the earth around me. Now, that sounds very hippy dippy, but that's genuinely the experience I had listening to that when it when it first came on. Tell me about that track. Um, so Partnabuki literally in Irish means the song of the spirits or a song of the fairies, uh, depending on your interpretation of the Irish and uh it's an old song it was i'm i'm trying to remember who it was that wrote it in the first place i think it's disputed actually who wrote it in the first place um and it was meant to be played on originally it was played on fiddle and it's someone sailing out on a river on a boat uh to an island and they're hearing the fairies calling to them across the water um and that's the the story of it and it's a very it's a very beloved irish air you'll hear an awful lot of fiddle players will play that if they're asked to play a, a slow air. And I remember, I mean, with, with so the thing with the winding way down to Kells Bay, which on the album is followed directly by Pertnabuki, Kells Bay is written to be played at a sing song. The intention of that song was that, so when my, the, the, the inspiration for the song was my grand uncle, uh, Eamon, who lived in uh, Cahir Savine in South Kerry. And, the the night before he died or the night before he had his heart attack we were all at a big sing song locally and the point of the sing song was you brought a local song 
and you could have no sheet music, no lyrics, no chords, nothing with you. You had to have it off by heart. And the whole point of the sing song was to celebrate and um, sort of solidify local tradition. Um, and I, I went along to it and I'm not from the area and I don't know any local songs, so I didn't have anything local to sing. Um, and then the next day, Eamon died. And it was his kind of brainchild, as far as I'm aware, this sing song. Uh, so I wrote the song as something that I could bring along the next time I was there. It still hasn't happened. That was 2018. Um, but the next time I go to the corner house and go to that sing song, there's the winding way down to Kells Bay, which is for everyone there to sing along with. And one night I played the song and I asked Alec, my cellist and friend, if he would play something directly following it, something in a similar key, just something to kind of celebrate that side of the sing song that people bring instruments and people play something and just just something you know and he played that and it just it was perfect it was so perfect and it turned out as I didn't know and I don't think he knew either it's actually a Kerry air so it's it's something that someone local could easily have brought along and the way he played it was so raw and he puts his own spin on it and there's no kind of frilliness to it or anything it's just someone sitting there in a dark room playing at by a fireplace with a pint in front of them playing a tune for everyone and so ever since that first night when he played that song it's gone hand in hand with Kells Bay and it has that real as you say that kind of earthiness to it it grounds you and it it makes you look around and it's got a stillness to it that is really really striking mm. um I, you know, I, I, any musician I have with me on a gig now, if Alec can come, I'll ask them to play something to follow Kells Bay as a celebration of the other side of a sing song, which is someone coming and just playing a tune. Um, but Part Nabuki will always be the one, you know. What, what, what a fantastic, just when, when you were talking about uh, Kells Bay there, what a fantastic gift you've given the memory of, of your uncle, but also the, 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 the place itself. It's, it's fantastic. And myself and Paul, last week, we went to see Damon Alburn in the National Concert Hall, and he spoke about um, his, his new album is kind of a, a, is a very mellow album. And he talks about he talked about trying to bring the audience into another world. And I think with a lot of your music for the listener, you are brought into another world. You're you're you're, you're taken out of of the the, the mundane day to day life, and you're brought to a much more peaceful, uh, spiritual place almost. And it, 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 when when you t- t- I didn't know what Port Nabuki meant, um, but the fact that you're talking about spirits and stuff, and it evokes that uh, feeling that I that I talked about, it's almost spooky in a way because. Uh, it's brilliant but but another part of the show um for a bit of light relief now <laughs> <laughs> away from talking about spirits and so on is <laughs> is we we ask our guests uh 10 questions at random and you don't have to think too deeply about them your answer can be as short as you want or as long as you want um but i'm just going to throw questions at you and you answer them whatever way you want um, or or tell me to feck off if you don't want to answer them. That's okay as well. Um, so the first one is rugby or hurling? Oh, God. Oh, you see, now you, you've told the wrong person to not think too much of it. I am an overthinker in my nature. I can't help it. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say, I'm going to say hurling. <laughs> okay. Do I have to explain why? Uh, yeah, go on, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay so my logic my logic is I remember I distinctly remember watching the the Kamogi finals and being blown away by just how much it felt like I'd traveled back in time just these incredible warriors with sticks <laughs> poking a stone around the place and just it's just this I mean granted I I love rugby as well but there's something in the Irishness of hurling and camogie and and that that I just I just think is class and as a creative person I'm gonna go hurling brilliant great answer sorry Ka- rugby people <laughs> <laughs> you've just lost a load of fans there oh, I'm, dear, rug- I'm only joking uh, cats so are- cancelled <laughs> yeah cancelled for hating on rugby uh cats or dogs dogs okay why I just, I love both. I do love both for different reasons, but dogs have been a bigger part of my life. And as someone who needs to be constantly reminded 
if someone actually likes me or not. Dogs do that. Uh, cats do not. Yeah. And uh, I love cats for their independence and for how much they teach us about consent. Awesome. But as as again, as someone very deeply insecure who needs to be constantly told whether someone hates me or not, dogs are just like, you're great and I love you. Oh my God, this is amazing. Oh my God, you're just here and you're giving me pets. This is amazing. So yeah, dogs. <laughs> Brilliant. What's one piece of advice that you'd give your younger self? Relax. That's it, to be honest. At every given possible opportunity, relax. Because I was so, so painfully self-aware as a young person and and not in a taking the piss out of myself way in a never wanting to be the the least intelligent person in the room kind of way in like just this very annoying uh precocious kind of way and she was someone who read too much into absolutely everything all the time um now granted life is hard as a young person and when you are your own person you know it's hard to find peers but yeah I guess I don't know simultaneously relax about who you are relax about people around you also do a bit of fucking work like (laughs) Jesus Christ like study it's not like just pick up a book and study like you will actually have you'll achieve whatever you want and you'll have learned stuff and it'll be class so you know both of those things at the same time love it love it and i i have an idea for some emma langford merch now you know those okay you know those frankie says relax t-shirts mm-hmm. you could get emma says relax t-shirts and, and flog I them on it. your website That's i'll only idea. sell them i'll only sell them to teenagers yeah exactly be class. <laughs> so people have to like provide id on purchase <laughs> brilliant how many instruments can you play oh um just like three four four i think just four yeah oh, well yeah. <laughs> I mean like I can play guitar I can uh, there's the kind of can play school of thought like I can kind of play bass I can kind of play ukulele I can kind of play keys um and I have in the past played brass instruments apparently I have the perfect embouchure to play brass instruments because I do a fake uh, brass instrument impression on my album and come on I think it's the real deal but g- uh, give us a blast <laughs> Wow, you're 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 grade eight. What can I say? Yeah, I can incredible. kind of play grade eight, whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> okay, it, what describe what what's if you could let me think of another one. If you could collab, <laughs> I, do you know what my problem was there? I'm looking at my questions written down, and I can't actually read my own handwriting. So ah, that's okay. what, what's confusing me there. But what's your favorite and least favorite thing about being a musician? Okay, uh, my favorite thing about being a musician is, um, as someone who struggles to connect with people socially a lot of the time, it is the frequent opportunity to get up on stage and make friends and communicate a bit more about who I am to people who maybe don't fully understand me. Um, yeah, I love I love that I can stand up on a stage. Everyone else is in darkness, so I don't have to think about who's in the room. I just get to be myself in a very full way on stage, which is very nice. Mm. So I'd say that's probably probably up there among my favorites. And my least favorite is the um Oh god, there's so many things. Uh, um the self-criticism, I would say, the trying to balance the ego of selling what you do to people and convincing people you're good enough that they want to buy tickets and buy your CD and support you with the self-criticism, I think, that is needed to constantly grow and become a better person and musician. So that that balancing act is probably my least favorite thing. It's the it's a psychological roller coaster at all times. And it's very difficult to to manage that, I guess. Um, I, I always lean more toward I'm shit and need to be better and trying to, yeah, just just trying to find find that balance is is difficult, I would say. So, yeah. OK. 
And, and just and the last one of these questions then is, tell us something, t- tell me someone in music who you really admire and more than that, tell me why you admire them and what are their kind of traits that inspire you? Um, there are so many people. I think there's there's like a little cluster of women um, who all would have been on the scene around the same time. So there's like Sinead O'Connor, Leslie Dowdle, Maria Doyle Kennedy, um, Eddie Reader, like these women who have been through it and have seen the music industry for like in one of its worst times in terms of um, gender balance, in terms of respect for women, in terms of there being a world there for women to be part of. Eleanor McAvoy is one of these as well, Maura O'Connor, all of these brilliant women who who have come through that and now have this self-assuredness and self-confidence and and this this awareness of of the, the space they take up in the industry and what they're entitled to as as artists of their caliber and i think it's a place you need to earn um you know it's a, it's a confidence and it's a it's a space that you sh- you do need to earn but they have shown me and other musicians so much about about how we should expect to be treated as artists and and how we should expect to be received and they fight their corner and they're very oh you know they they use social media and they talk about issues eddie reader is amazing for talking about social issues um Sinead o'connor is is such a, a phenomenal open honest woman mm. and she's very vulnerable in so many ways but she makes herself very vulnerable as well in her honesty and I have so much respect for that yeah um i wish she didn't have to be i wish life was easier for her yeah. um but you know these women i think have have played such a big part in my understanding of the industry um so yeah i've i've massive respect for them um and i i want to be like them when i grow up yeah well, I, I really admire all your answers to all those questions emma because sometimes you know people can be full of kind of this uh, show personship and bravado when we ask these kind of questions. But the thing I always get from watching interviews with yourself and talking to you now through this interview is that I get the sense that there's no bullshit. You know, you just kind of, you're very open and honest and transparent in terms of your answers and what drives you. And, 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 and indeed, when I asked you the question about what you don't like about being a musician and so on, you speak very openly about your 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 kind of your mindset and so on, and that's something I absolutely admire. Uh, so so thanks for for answering in those ways. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, and I I think you know one of all the the amazing artists you referenced there are people that that I have, would have such admiration for, but in particular for me, I think Sinead O'Connor is mm. is is. Um, I mean, to call her a legend doesn't doesn't come close. Uh, she and it's just from doing this pod for the last year with myself and Dan. You know, we got to know music a little bit better. Maybe the effect it has, the influence it has, where it goes. As you know, you're doing pods, you're doing different albums, mm. and uh, a ta- like again to call her a towering figure doesn't come close in terms of her influence. Um, and the quality of the records, the quality uh, of of the of the back catalogue from from the beginning right up into the present day, um, she is just an absolutely remarkable, and I've nothing but the the but admiration for. Her. But everyone you mentioned there uh, was is amazing. Maria Doll Kennedy is another one, absolutely fantastic. And I mean, I, I mean, I look at someone like that and I say, wow. That kind of talent. I mean, more talent yeah. in her little finger than most people. You know, just incredible. Oh, she's know? unbelievable. That woman contains a multitude. She's like, you know, because she's an extraordinary actress as well, Amazing. and she's so open to being whatever she is on any given day. Yeah. Like whether she's going to be a musician today, or a songwriter, or an actor, or if she's going to go painting, or whatever it is she wants to do. She's just like, I am a creative person, and that manifests itself in so many ways, and I'm just going to be my be myself every day and be open to whatever happens. Yeah. I think that's, I, it's amazing. It's really cool. She's such a stunning actor, as, as, mm. as you said. I mean, absolutely, and so incredibly assured in everything that she's doing, yeah. you know, it's quite quite remarkable. I, I mean, just maybe to, to, to finish for me, Emma, is just really be interested. I mean, thanks so much for joining us on the pod, and 
just what this album is going to stand the test of time. No doubt about that. And um, but I suppose a question for me is where do you go now from here? What's your what are you doing at the what's your what's your plan? <laughs> or is there or how do you what's your what's your next big thing? Yeah, I don't usually I don't usually um go with plans as such. So I'm in a weird place now where I actually do kind of have one. Um so I'm currently I'm meant to be right I've got I got Arts Council funding and I've gotten loads of support for this and I need to just get the finger out and get moving on it a bit more but um I'm working on an album of songs about Irish women in history so um focusing on the stories untold the stories unknown largely so um I created a suite of music last year with two collaborators around uh Saint Gubnet who is Ireland's patron saint of bees and blacksmiths and she was from the Gaeltacht or she was actually from um County Clare I believe but she's her her parish is in the Gaeltacht in Cork in Ballyvorney so we went there and we wrote pieces inspired by and about her and I'm working on a project with Emer Noon, who is the first ever woman to conduct an orchestra at the Oscars, and she's from Galway, and we're working on a project about Grainne Whale, who's the Pirate Queen, and so I've got a song in the works about her, and then, I mean, though, you know, Gubnet is, is relatively obscure and unknown, Grainne is very well known, um, and in between then, I'm working on stuff that is like the story of the lace workers in Limerick, the stories of the women that held off the, I think it was the Williamites at John's Gate, the women who gathered with pots and pans and fought off soldiers from England from coming in. Like all of these incredible stories that are not known about. Um, so the next record is going to be sort of shining a light on on those kind of voices unheard, stories unknown about brilliant, brilliant women that made this country what it is. Wow. Um, so that's that's the focus. That's the hope. I've got a pile of books sitting in front of me that I really need to get into. Um, and yeah, that's that's the plan. Can't wait for that, Emma. Can't wait. Um, thanks again for joining us on on the on the pod. We really appreciate it and really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, guys. It's been an absolute joy. Thanks a million.